All right. Now let's go to the next speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Robert Geller, and his talk is called "Is uh, Rethinking Seismology: Lessons from the 2011 Tohoku Earthquake and Fukushima Nuclear Ac Accident." Oh, thank you very much. Okay, well, anyway, I can see it there. So, um, this meeting and um, for inviting me. Um, you're, you're hungry, so I'll try to I'll make this as quick as possible. Uh, my talk today will be in two parts. The first will be some stuff particular to Japan, and the second will be um, some more general things about hazard modeling and um, earthquake fault modeling. So first of all, I, I've been at the University of Tokyo for, for about 28 years now, so um, I, so so in terms of this talk, besides the purely scientific issues, I, I have um, some discussion of um, policy-related issues that um, are very important in Japan. So first, let's start by talking about earthquake hazard maps. The good news is that we have um, methods for making hazard maps. The not so good news is that um, these methods haven't been objectively verified. And the bad news is that the maps don't agree with the data. <laughs> so I, I said this in a way designed to make you laugh. But as you'll see, this is a serious problem. So let's start with the Japanese national hazard map. Um, the area marked in red here is the area on the so-called Tokai earthquake or Nankai earthquake or Konankai earthquake, which are just scenarios. They're, they're not real earthquakes. They're the name given to hypothetical earthquakes that haven't occurred yet. Some guy said in the mid-1970s that the so-called Tokai earthquake could happen any day now. Well, it's been 35 years, and it hasn't happened. But in the meantime, for example, the Tohoku the Tohoku earthquake in 2011, and the Kobe earthquake, and so on, have happened and have caused massive damage. So we have to say that the hazard map um, doesn't do a very good job of predicting nature. So after the Tohoku earthquake last year, some people said it was unforeseeable. The Japanese word is sote gai. And, and, um, this, the use of this word involves some um, efforts by the utility, the utility company and the government to escape legal liability for um, the damage due to the earthquake and the tsunami and the nuclear reactor. So whether you um, accept this or not has um, a big economic impact on who, who pays for the damage. Well, as a matter of fact, they did designed for a much smaller tsunami than the one that hit Fukushima. So in one sense, it was unforeseen. But should it have been foreseen? And I, I say, generally speaking, yes. Well, 
the evidence that went unheeded was the tsunami history of Tohoku, even what was known in 1965, let alone what came to light later. Then the prevalence of magnitude 9 earthquakes around the Pacific. You've just heard Emil talking about that. Then paleo tsunami evidence from Tohoku and warnings that were made specifically at government committees um, after the Sumatra earthquake. So there, there were lots of chances to rethink things, but basically the, the utility com company and the government blew all, blew all of these off. They simply ignored these for um, more or less economic reasons. OK, well, going back to 1965, there were large tsunami runouts known in San Riku, but not around Fukushima. Um, so what, what the government and utility company used specifically the tsunami history of um, Fukushima in designing for the Fukushima nuclear plant. But obviously, this was unwise. There, there was no reason for them to think that um, San Riku type tsunamis could not also hit Fukushima, even back in 1965. So um, right at the beginning of the ball game, they, they were going in with um, an unwise um, cavalier attitude about down, downrating the risk. Then moving forward, even in, let's say, 1980, um, magnitude 9 earthquakes in Chile and Alaska and um, Kamchatka were known. Then adding to this, you had Sumatra, as Emil talked about. So they, they should have at least considered the probability, possibility of a magnitude 9 in Tohoku. But um, they didn't reconsider this after Sumatra, even after um, they were specifically asked about this at an advisory committee hearing in 2009. Also, the now famous um, Jogan earthquake in the year 869 um, was known as the result of work by Minamura and his colleagues, and also another group who, who worked with the um, Tohoku Electric Power Company. So th this was also ignored. So um, McCaffrey, and then also um, the paper by Stein and Opal, also warned that you could have a magnitude 9 anywhere um, at any subduction zone. And this was ignored. So um, basically, we know the Earth has a history of um, 4.6 billion years. But we only have 100 years or so of instrumental seismology. So we, we ought to be a little cautious about site specific seismic hazard calculations. So we might be much better off just averaging globally around similar tectonic regions everywhere using trading off time and space. So I want to mention one other point relative to, to Japan, which is that um, here I am last year with the um, Genkai nuclear power station in the background. This is located in Saga Prefecture in Kyushu, um, on the Sea of Japan. And there, there are historical tsunamis known to have hit the Sea of Japan. And, and unfortunately, none, no really big ones in um, recent times. The 1983 Sea of Japan earthquake was moderately big. But we, we have even bigger ones historically. So we, we, in Japan, the regulata regulatory authorities and the government should be worried about um, nuclear power facilities located on the Sea of Japan side as well. And here, here we are at um, Jeju Island and also um, in the Sea of Japan. So um, we, we can't be complacent about the tsunami risk here either. OK, now this covers the first half of my talk. I, I talked about um, my paper in Nature last year and um, my paper last year in Bulletin of the Atomic Sciences. Now, moving forward, the, the next part of my talk will um, cover my paper with Seth Stein and um, Mian Lu 
which was just published in Tectonic Physics about problems of hazard maps. <coughs> and then my preprint with um, Jan Kahn and Dave Jackson and myself, which is um, to be published in Seismological Research Letters um, in November of this year, but is available from the um, ArchiveX preprint server. You, you can, if you want to read it, you can Google it and um, take a look while I'm talking. So um, now, looking at some figures from hazard maps, um, this is from my paper with Seth and um, Miang. So the, the Wenchan earthquake in China in 2008. The left is the USGS hazard map, and the, the black rectangle is the actual earthquake fault. And, and this occurred in a region that was not predicted by the hazard map to be especially dangerous. Now, in Algeria, you had several large earthquakes in 2003 and 2004. And these were also in areas described by um, a hazard map as being relatively safe. The um, MS Nam earthquake in 1980, there, there's a big bullseye around that. So basically, um, the, the hazard maps, um, I'm, I'm slightly over, oversimplifying the issue. But basically, the hazard maps are made using methodology for predicting the past rather than predicting the future. And they work very well for telling you where, where um, there have been earthquakes, but not where there are going to be. So um, there, there's a cynical term in the United States, Texas sharpshooting. But this means you take your rifle, you shoot at the barn, and then you paint both eyes around the bullet holes, rather than the normal practice of first painting the bullseye and then shooting at the target. OK, now um, in Haiti in 2010, you, you had the same problem. So um, the Dominican Republic was supposed to be dangerous. But where, where the actual strong shaking happened was, was around here. So now in Parkfield, based on supposed periodicity, the, the USGS predicted a magnitude 6 characteristic earthquake with a 95% probability um, in the window from 1985 until 1993. Well, the, predict the predicted quake actually had some of the parameters, but um, in fact, nothing happened until 2004. So we, we didn't have to worry about whether um, the prediction was satisfying or not. So, OK, so the hazard maps aren't working. Well, one possibility is they're just unlucky. Um, but there, there have been too many instances of bad luck. So the second possibility that I'd like to um, close by talking about is that maybe the, the physics assumed in making the hazard maps might be different than the actual physics. Now, perhaps we ought to consider this. Well, th this is the final um, ma the characteristic earthquake model, 1884 to 2011. Now, for those of you who are not native speakers of English, RIP means rest in peace. Um, it's what we put on the tombstone of people who are dead. So um, Jan and Dave and I picked a modest and non-provocative title um, that no one is going to pay any attention to. Um, so we, we are suggesting that perhaps the characteristic earthquake model, which was first proposed by Gilbert in 1884, can be said as of the Tohoku earthquake to have outlived this um, lifetime and to have passed away. So there, there, there are some technical terms that are frequently used in um, papers in earthquake science. We, we call these buzzwords. And, and what we mean by buzzwords is words that everybody uses. But they're not really well defined. There, there's no underlying, underlying theory. And it's OK to use them because um, everyone uses them. So therefore, everyone uses them. It, it's a purely 
circular um, procedure and, and there, there's no factual backup. So we did a, a, a search on the Web of Science database and some of the popular ones that still pop up um, maybe 50 or 60 times just in the last three years are earthquake cycle, seismic cycle, seismic gap, and characteristic earthquake. And all of these have in common that they assume sequences of nearly identical earthquakes except for the time. And if these model, if the characteristic earthquake model, seismic gap model, what was accurate, then you can just reduce earthquake occurrence to one parameter. You have your characteristic earthquake model, and then um, the only thing you need to know is, is when the next one will happen. Um, so some common additional assumptions are that um, the characteristic earthquake dominates the displacement on um, fault or plane boundary segments. Now, now segments are another um, one of these buzzwords. OK, so um, moving along. So we, we have these models that the seismic gap or seismic cycle model, they, they assume characteristic quakes plus quasi-periodicity. So since the 1990s, there have been numerous um, statistical tests that have um, rejected these models. You can find the most recent one in 2003 in the paper by um, one of um, Kagan and Jackson's students, who was the first author, Rong, R-O-N-G. So Rong, um, Kagan and Jackson in JGR. And basically, no one has refuted the work of um, Kagan and his colleagues. Um, so we, we have to, there, there are many people who don't like it. I, I can see some seething people in, in this um, meeting room. But anyway, reality is reality, that, that no one has refuted these statistical tests. Although there are many people who don't like them, and in fact, who, who do their best to ignore them. So furthermore, we, we had the 2004 Sumatra quake or 2011 Tohoku quake, which both um, ripped through numerous um, supposed segment boundaries. So we, we should um, go back to science. Um, we need to scrap ideas that have been um, rejected by objective statistical testing or, or that are too vague to in fact even be testable. And what we need is, is a new paradigm of earthquake occurrence. So thank you very much for your attention and enjoy your lunch. Questions? Uh, thank you, Dr. Um, I think uh, if we don't agree on the use of the term seismic cycle, things like that, we can go uh, back to the basics and, and uh, we have something which is causality, perhaps. And um, earthquake happened because uh, you have forces and uh, you have some sort of stress that is accumulated and reduced. So the failure of the statistical tests are not um, a full argument, a complete argument against it. Uh, concerns because, for example, the part of that way was not um, successfully predicted for the type of terms, but it happened. So there was something, an element of success about this prediction. And then you have also occurrence of smaller magnitude earthquakes there that are characteristics uh, for specific reasons, for example, they generate the same waveforms over and over over 40 years of observations. So there is some appeal of using this in some contexts. So, but I agree with you that we should then define what they mean and step down appropriately. Well, thank you for the chance to point out some additional fallacies that I didn't have time in my talk. So, first, um, first fallacy, you, you said that earthquakes repeat. Now, since I wrote the first paper on this subject with Chuck Mueller in GRL in, in 1980, um, the, the fallacy in, in what you said is that it's not that the earthquakes repeat. It's that if you filter the earthquakes at long periods, the waveforms are um, identical. But then if you 
presently increase the fast band to, to higher frequencies, you, you see very distinct differences. So there, we, we call them similar earthquakes um, rather than repeating earthquakes. Next, you, you say you want to invoke causality. But your, your idea of causality seems to be to predict things that have already occurred rather than things that are going to occur in the future. Now, we, we know that earthquakes occur, and we know that the Gutenberg-Richter um, relations are very well satisfied in general. And we also know that if you look at a large population of earthquake data, and, and you retrospectively cherry pick um, samples, out, out, very small samples to support some kind of idea out of this large sample, that, that you can find data to support anything. But one of the basic principles of physics um, is, is that um, we have to take all of the data re rather than do retrospective selection. So after the fact, we know once in a while that large earthquakes occur, but we know that small earthquakes are occurring all the time. And there, there's no, all, all of these release energy from the same pool. There's no basis for saying that, that any particular large earthquake was always waiting to happen. Regarding the periodicity, I'm, I'm not a seismologist, but from the tsunami point of view, uh, there was an interesting work. It shows that the problem often is that we don't have a long enough time series of observations. Uh, on the west coast of the US, uh, regarding Cascadia, there is a long time series of paleo tsunami uh, observation that has been analyzed about 2,000 years uh, by George Priest and others there. And, so they looked at the periodicity of, of the full rock juice of Cascadia, and they could find a periodicity of about 300 years, about six of those very large events over 2,000 years, and then smaller ones with different periodicity. So at least in the effects of the earthquake, if you can have the observations, you can find those uh, periods, and, and then perhaps it's fair for the future that you should expect this to be. And, and then a, a comment about the nuclear power plants, since I'm involved a little bit on that in the US, uh, the recent rules that have been issued that there are about 27 power plants that are close to the water enough to be affected by tsunamis or large uh, floods. So the tsunami flooding is being re-evaluated for a 20,000 year tsunami, whatever that means. Because again, how do you make up a scenario for 20 million tsunami when you don't have enough data. So the whole question now is about probabilistic tsunami hazard analysis and how you, you can create a design ever that satisfies that long periodicity. Well, getting back to the issue of the alleged periodicity, if, if, you, if you look only at earthquakes in one very small place and you have a few samples only, you, you can delude yourself into thinking you found periodicity. But um, as we know from Hartfield, that only works in retrospect, not going forward. But also, there's no reason for thinking that earthquakes in Cascadia should be a unique phenomenon with, with physics different from earthquakes all over the rest of the world. So you have to use the largest sample possible from all of the earthquakes all over. And, and um, so it's a very bad scientific habit. Just to look at um, data from one small region to try to think about what the hazard will be in that it's small region. It's so small because it's the most of the west coast of the United States and also east coast of Japan that, that has that polyotonic evidence that has been analyzed. But I agree. I mean, that's not my work. I mean, I, this is a legitimate concern. I think, I think the, one of the key issues that we've learned in the past uh, 10 years, in a sense, and thanks to the work of uh, people like uh, uh, Brian Porter and Marco Cisternas in Chile, in particular, and, and in other places, is that uh, there is a difference between repeating earthquakes that we can date and find some kind of regularity in their occurrence, and then periodicity, which means in physics that it's exactly the same phenomenon that occurred. And then what was, what was found in Chile, for example, is that out of um, a regular, reasonably regular sequence of five or six earthquakes, which were well documented since uh, Spaniards conquered uh, South America and, and left some reports there. 
Um, when you look carefully at the value of seismic evidence, you, you, you find that they are not created equal. And that some of them are way bigger, for example, the children of the 60 are way bigger than the others. So, uh, and also, you know, getting back to the San Andreas, for example, um, how can you define periodicity if you take all the work that Gary C. did uh, 30 years ago, and you want to define a, periodic, a periodicity there? And it's usually pretty random. I mean, maybe there is some sequence of referential repeat times, but uh, it certainly would uh, not fit the, the, the notion of periodicity. All right, before we uh, rush to lunch, let's give the old speakers a hand. And then...